Fairy tales have been around, it seems, since the printed word, maybe even before that. We've been telling these stories for centuries, and thanks to the Brothers Grimm, many have been passed down from generation to generation. With the creation of film, these stories were quickly moved from the page to the screen, be it big or small. These stories would teach us about ourselves and the world, and somehow, they never get old. We can apply them to every decade through today, and the stories can still ring true and teach us lessons. On this episode of Gone But Not Forgotten, we're going to dig back into the past, say, oh, nearly 40 years ago, to when one of the greatest love stories in all of fiction was updated to the then modern time of 1987 which became one of the best and favorite versions of an eternal classic for many. Once Upon a Time is now, as we return to the underground and remember Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> Creating a new version of an old story and making it stand out is a hard task. Beauty and the Beast had been retold a number of times already before the CBS TV series brought the story to the small screen. And remember, this was before Disney took their shot at the tale. At this point, there was one version that stood crown and fur above all others, and that was Jean Cocteau's La Belle et la Bette that was made in 1946. This beautiful, haunting version of the story starred Josette Day and Jean Marais and had a very feline looking beast. Shelley Duvall would recreate this version in her fairy tale theater episode with Susan Sarandon as Beauty and, I kid you not, Klaus Kinski as the Beast Prince. The CBS series would be created by fantasy TV maven Ron Coslow, who had previously written the feature film Into the Night. Coslow had a knack for fantasy on the small screen and would wind up writing and producing shows like Roar, Moonlight, and the short-lived DC series Birds of Prey. Beauty and the Beast was different though as it actually made it past a single season and was, in a way, one of the first of its kind when it came to primetime TV. It was a fantasy romance mixed with a healthy dose of police procedural. While you may hear that and wonder how that would even work, We'll get into that in a moment. Coslow's story takes place in modern New York and follows Catherine Chandler, a beautiful and successful socialite in Manhattan. She's going to work as a lawyer in her rich father's firm and has a brilliant and beautiful life ahead of her. And then one night, she is brutally attacked and left for dead when a case of mistaken identity changes her life forever. Catherine is saved by Vincent, and is brought down to his world that exists underneath the streets of Manhattan. The world below is a self-sufficient, completely off-grid place that is filled with people who need to hide from the world above. It's a beautifully steampunk type of realm that exists thanks to abandoned subway lines and forgotten places. Much like some of the people who live there, no one knows of this hidden jewel beneath the streets. Thanks to Vincent's care and the help of his wise father, the default leader of this place, Catherine recovers. Vincent reads to her as her face is covered with bandages and she's too weak to really do much more than rest. But one day, Catherine wakes up and removes the bandages, seeing her own disfigurement. Large scars and stitches cover her cheeks and that's when she first sees Vincent. Vincent looks like a lion with a full mane and large incisors. His hands are covered in fur and he has claws. There's no explanation for why he is as he is. And Catherine, who at this point is already more than a little in love with him, accepts him. Vincent, for his part, is completely enamored with her, but knows she must return to her world above. Her life has changed in many ways from the experience. She will always have some hidden scars on her face, even after plastic surgery from her attack. Then starts taking self-defense classes and learns how to handle a gun. She finds herself pulling away from her rich society friends. Instead of continuing at her father's firm, she joins the far less grandiose and lucrative DA's office, much to the chagrin of her father and her rich friends. 
Catherine spends her time investigating the case that led to her attack, finding the woman she was mistaken for named Carol Stabler. This investigation leads to Catherine putting herself in danger again, with Vincent reappearing to save her once more. The bond between Catherine and Vincent is a strong one, allowing him to feel her emotions and sense when she is in peril. The intro of the series speaks to this eventuality in future episodes. And although we cannot be together, we will never, ever be apart. Future episodes of the series will follow a similar path, with Catherine investigating crimes and Vincent coming to her rescue, typically riding on the top of subway trains as a means of fast transit and to allow his glorious hair to billow in the breeze. No lie, for the one year I lived in NYC, Every time I rode a subway car, I'd always say aloud, Is Vincent up there? And people would look at me like I was nuts. No regrets. The series would eventually expand the world below. We would learn more about Father and the other denizens of Vincent's realm. This is one of the parts of the series I really love. The mythology that's created on the show. With such details like the underground world where the inhabitants communicate with Morse code on pipes and a group of overworld helpers that provide them with food and resources. We find out more about Father's past and how he used to be a doctor, which is why he was able to help Catherine survive her injuries. We also are introduced to some recurring characters of dubious natures. One of these is Elliot Birch, played by the late Edward Albert, son of actor Eddie Albert. Birch would become a love interest for Catherine, which caused some problems with Vincent. The great character actor Tony Jay would portray father's arch nemesis and one-time friend Paracelsus. Like father, Paracelsus took a different name when he helped create the world below, choosing the name of the famous doctor. Pascal was another fan favorite character. Played by Armin Scheimerman of Star Trek fame, he was the master of the pipes and was integral in communication throughout the world below. The series became a surprise hit for CBS, which was due to a rabid fan base which had no qualms with how much they loved their beast. In fact, the attitude of the fans shows that Vincent may have had to hide underground so he wasn't mobbed by women wanting to make the lion roar. They said, we're doing this Beauty and the Beast thing for TV. It's got to be like a monster, but it has to be attractive to women. You know, I go, okay, well, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> Too far? Maybe. I mean, I think I've gotten more fan mail for the Vincent makeup than anything I've ever done. And I got, you know, so many women were so in love with Vincent, you know, and... But it was true. And Ron Perlman, the agent, you know, came up to me once and said, Rick, you've worked a miracle. I go, never in my life did I ever imagine that Ron Perlman would be a, a, a sex symbol, you know? <laughs> it's like, you know... Fans loved Vincent and Catherine, and it showed. There were novelizations based on episodes of the series, and there was a soundtrack album which included Vincent reading poetry in between musical tracks. So now I think it's time we talked about the two leads, the beauty and the beast of the series. Linda Hamilton was cast as Catherine Chandler. Hamilton was a stunning actress and also a powerhouse performer. Beauty and the Beast came after Terminator and King Kong Lives, but before Terminator 2, when she changed herself into the badass version of Sarah Connor. Hamilton was great in the series, giving Catherine an intelligence, class, and heart that was needed to make the show work. Her beauty wasn't just outward, but within. Ron Perlman would be cast as Vincent. Perlman had already started working in genre films in the early 80s, much like Hamilton. He was quite simply born to play Vincent. His rough whisper delivery, the way he wore the makeup so perfectly, and how he convinced viewers he was this mythical type creature who could quote you Shakespeare. Not to mention being able to hold onto the A train while rushing to your rescue by his claws alone. Stop judging me. I, I can't help it I love that the subway is his silver steed, okay? Perlman took the job to heart much like he would years later as Hellboy when he went full into the costume for a sick little boy whose wish was to meet Hellboy. When it came time to record his dialogue for the soundtrack cassette, he did it in full makeup and costume. That's called dedication, kids. If you want to know why Vincent's makeup and look was so amazing, 
Look no further than the man who created it. Special effects legend Rick Baker, the man behind, well, everything, created Vincent. Baker had already racked up an amazing list of credits by this point, changing the game in 1981 with an American wolf in London. He knew how to make a man into a beast and would go on to win a number of awards doing just that and continues to do so. My dream from the time I was, even before I was 10 years old, was to, to be a makeup artist and to work in films. Another interesting fact was that writer George R.R. R. Martin was involved in the show. I know, right? It's crazy. Before killing the majority of his characters in Game of Thrones, Martin was one of the head writers on Beauty and the Beast. He would actually appear on screen as a diner at a restaurant in the episode entitled Fever. As with most series, changes would happen over the course of three seasons and one really major one would occur in the final season. The second season would see a bit of a switch on the plots, with more of a focus on the world below, with Paracelsus and his attempts of taking over. This season would also see Catherine lose her father in an episode that is considered one of the best of the series called Orphans. There's also more of a supernatural bent with Vincent and Catherine's bond growing, possible spellcraft, and a fan favorite episode called Masks that sees Vincent able to walk about unafraid during Halloween in the world above. This season also gave us insight into how Vincent was found and how he became part of the world below. The third season though, saw the biggest changes for the series. CBS was desperately trying to get more viewers to watch the show. Even though Beauty and the Beast was quite celebrated and still popular. But sadly, the end of the 80s also meant the end of the series. A more brutal tone to the show started with the first and second episodes being a swan song for the beauty in the title. Linda Hamilton had become pregnant in real life and wanted to have time to spend with her baby. The writers penned a script where Catherine became pregnant with Vincent's son and gives birth to the child. She then dies in Vincent's arms as the villain of the season, Gabriel, a crime lord, takes the baby and escapes, which he does after injecting Catherine with the poison that kills her. The title of the two-parter, The Lovers Be Lost, is taken from the poem that the two lovers speak to one another in their final goodbye. No. Lovers be lost. Love shall not. It's hard to have a series named Beauty and a Beast without the beauty of the title, but another strong female lead stepped into the series with the character Diana Bennett, played by actress Jo Anderson. Diana is assigned the case of Catherine's death and teams up with Vincent who is beset by despair and loss with only revenge on his mind. The third season follows Diana and Vincent as they go up against Gabriel in their quest to find Vincent's child and to get justice for Catherine's murder. This major change in the third season was sadly a nail in the coffin of the series. You can't blame Linda Hamilton for wanting to be with her baby, but also the series had already started having troubles and the network wanted to get more eyes on it. So there was an attempt at wooing male viewers with the inclusion of criminals like Gabriel and more action, violent scenes. It didn't work, and the series was actually canceled after the final episode aired. But at least the finale gave Vincent a happy ending, reuniting him with his son and finding a friend in Diana, wrapping the series up as well as it could be. As an aside, I'm pretty sure Andrew Lloyd Webber saw this season and used it as a blueprint for his Phantom of the Opera sequel, Love Never Dies. Check that out and tell me if I'm wrong. Beauty and the Beast was a magical series that also showed the world that modern fantasy could find a home on TV. Where the series introduced many to steampunk and the world below's aesthetic and how the denizens survived, it also combined a few genres that hadn't really been seen together romance, crime drama, and fantasy. Kozlo would return to this some years later on CBS with the vampire series Moonlight. But aside from that, this dynamic would return with Forever Night, Grimm, and then a massively popular show Once Upon a Time, just to name a few. The way Beauty and the Beast was shot was also lovely and helped the otherworldliness along. 
While the scenes in New York were very bright and seemingly sterile, the world below had a softness and almost golden light being used. It felt like having entered a different world or time. Father's Library was a great example of this. Beauty and the Beast, as I said, had a number of fantastic actors, but one standout was veteran actor Roy Dotris, who played Father. Dotris had a massive career on stage and screen. He could be both intimidating and kind in the role of Vincent's adopted parent. He would appear in a number of genre series over the years, including Tales from the Dark Side, Angel, and Game of Thrones. One nice callback appearance Dotris had was in Ron Perlman's second turn as Hellboy, where he played King Baylor, ruler of all the magical races. Dotris would pass away in 2017 at the age of 92. Other actors who would appear in Beauty and the Beast might surprise you. Bruce Abbott was married to Linda Hamilton at the time he appeared in the series. In the first season, his reanimator co-star, Jeffrey Combs, would also appear in the episode No Way Down. James Hong and Adrian Paul would also appear in following episodes. One of the greatest bits of casting was the fantastic Stephen McHattie as Gabriel, alongside Lance Henriksen as an assassin named Snow. I've said for years these two need to be brothers in something, but I think this is as close as I'll ever see. So here we are with the question, as always, that must be asked. Should Beauty and the Beast come back? Well, it actually did. Ron Coslow was executive producer on Beauty and the Beast, which aired on The CW in 2012 and actually lasted for four seasons. The series changed things up with Katherine Chandler now being a police detective and Vincent being a genetically engineered ex-soldier who had rescued her years earlier. The two team up to help Kat, wink wink, find out who was behind her mother's murder. The show was very CW. And the titular Beast wasn't actually beastly until he got really mad. The series would star Smallville alum Kristen Crook as Katherine and Jay Ryan as Vincent. Beauty and the Beast, while appearing to be popular with fans, didn't score with the critics. While having a pathetic 19% rating for the first season on Rotten Tomatoes, but a 72% fan score. It would, however, prove to be a hit for the CW, scoring multiple People's Choice Awards. Go figure. Beauty and the Beast, the original series, though, would be a welcome respite in the days we live in. You can still watch the 1987 version on Paramount Plus and other streaming platforms for purchase. It holds up as it still feels like a fairy tale. The love story that is the heart of the series is a classic one that's filled with longing and tenderness that's rare to find. Ron Perlman and Linda Hamilton inhabited these characters in a timeless way that could have fit in a medieval setting as easily as it does in modern Manhattan. If we could find a way to bring back the world above and the world below, I think it would be a perfect time to do so. I think we could all use some magic and romance and a love that would protect us and dash to our rescue, as we could all do with a little saving nowadays.